I'm Anthony J. Hall. I'm a professor of globalization studies at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, which is a province in Canada. And you've written an article about the history of nuclear power. Why don't you talk about why you decided to write that article? I wrote an article called uh, From Hiroshima to Fukushima, 1945 to 2011. And of course, uh, as the news started to penetrate about what had happened in Fukushima, it was uh, poetic in a very tragic way because, of course, 1945, the Japanese people incurred the only attack, in this case, by the United States of America on, on, on a civilian population. They were nuked. And uh, the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, be Nagasaki became the basis of a huge uh, science experiment on human subjects. And unfortunately now we have the same phenomena with Fukushima that the people of Japan, especially Honshu Island, have become subjects in a, in a science experiment. There really is no, no uh, precedent for this accident. It's way beyond, I, I immediately thought this is way beyond anything uh, that happened at Chernobyl. As I started to investigate it and realized the 40 years of waste is on the plant, and uh, this is the Achilles heel. Uh, I'd worked on it 25 years ago, the, the nuclear waste uh, uh, issue. Uh, it's the Achilles heel of the nuclear industry. This nuclear waste uh, spent fuel rods can remain radioactive for sometimes hundreds of thousands of years, uh, billions of years in some cases, depending upon which radionuclides we're talking about. How do you keep uh, something separate, uh, this radioactive material separate from the air, the water, all life forms? How can you contain it? Uh, for basically all time. So, so that, uh, th there's never been an answer to that. Any community that sees a, a nuclear waste dump being planned for the region invariably mobilize against it. So what they did at Fukushima, like they do in the power plants here in California, they've just been storing the waste materials uh, on the site. And when you start to read about the the juxtaposition and concentration of different types of nuclear procedures at the Fukushima plant. So you have the, you know, the burning of the rods, the reactors, the spent fuel rods on top of the reactors, huge pools of, of waste, in some, in some cases caskets of nuclear waste, some of which may have floated off to sea after the, the tsunami. You have this uh, concentration of different procedures so if there's a problem in one it's going to spread to the other of course the dynamic in nuclear in nuclear reactions it's a chain reaction and we're going to see that at Fukushima even Toshi Toshiba is saying it's going to be 30 years uh, and some people say, come on, it's, it's 100 years at least. Uh, but we're going to see it, it, it one disaster beginning another disaster, one crisis spreading in, into another area. And, I don't, I, and, and we're obviously not getting the full story. Japan is extremely, uh, you know, there's, all, uh, there's nuclear plants, there's reprocessing, there's a, there's a great concentration of different industrial procedures there, and, and I don't think we've got the full reports about what, what's going wrong. Well, how is the United States involved in this? Well, uh, the United States, it, it, this is the U.S. nuclear industry in Japan. It is uh, U.S. companies that, 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 that built the system, that designed the system, and ultimately imposed and enforced the system on Japan. Um, in my article um, from, uh, from Hiroshima to Fukushima, well, first I discovered the reactors, the Mark I GE reactors, General Electric reactors, were designed in the process of building the first uh, nuclear submarine. Uh, Admiral Rickover's unit uh, was, you know, the Navy had been left out of the Manhattan Project, so the Navy wanted in. So the, the first uh, 
effort to use nuclear energy. These submarines, um, I hadn't realized that you know you can't run a diesel engine underwater. Uh, they run they ran in the Second World War by batteries. They could go a maximum of maybe 20 miles underwater. So this was the number one priority to get nuclear submarines. Rickover became a kind of a almost an evangelist for uh, nuclear energy. He built a, uh, a demonstration station. As soon as he got the nuclear submarine Nautilus going, he built on a land base at Shipping, shipping Port in Pennsylvania. And this became the kind of um, study center from which uh, uh, the nuclear energy industry uh, grew and, and proliferated. So the first uh, site for the, exporting the US nuclear energy industry was Japan. Now, it was so weren't the Japanese against nuclear energy and nuclear power? There, there were, were, there were uh, protests and such against it from from the very beginning but it was you know it, it was mind-boggling really to read about the period of the US occupation uh, when the US government was uh, the government of Japan was uh, ruling Japan they took the old leadership uh, from Imperial Japan and many of the, the top leadership ended up in Tsukamato uh, prison in Tokyo one of whom was uh, Matsutaro um, Shoriki who would become the first uh, nuclear energy czar, the first promoter. He was uh, vehemently anti-communist and in the atmosphere of anti-communism during the McCarthy era, um, the, the period where you know, periodic red scares in, in the United States, anybody who, would, who had really good credentials as an anti-communist was uh, elevated and, and given positions of uh, authority. So this uh, Shoriki uh, had been a propagandist in Imperial Japan, a police chief, a kind of mixture of J. Edgar Hoover and uh, R William Randolph Hearst. Um, he continued that role and, and he got the first license given his anti-communist credentials. He got the first television license, a commercial television license in Japan and it was all part of this anti-communist uh, psychological warfare uh, initiative. The, the first campaign that he did on his uh, new television station, which would become a network, was Adams for Peace. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was trying to sort of humanize the face of the nuclear energy and uh, the nuclear industry, which of course is uh, military at its roots. Um, General Electric got into the business to build Fat Man and Little Boy, the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, people in the early 1950s were freaking out really because the uh, Soviet Union was testing uh, nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. The United States was, was as well. Uh, it looked like uh, the world was being prepared to be destroyed uh, uh, and uh, in an effort to kind of calm the public uh, Eisenhower came up with this Adams for Peace idea. They have come from General Electric. Which, and of course, you know, in, in that era, uh, or shortly following that, General Electric had as its spokesperson a, an actor who kind of betrayed his union roots and went to the executive side in General Electric. Uh, his name was Ronald Reagan. Uh, so General Electric was obviously doing, you know, making military, you know, chief military contractor, and then if you could spin out aspects of this nuclear industry or all kinds of military production into sort of civilian uses, that's that, that's been the kind of pattern of the U.S. economy in that period and to this day, really, the, the heart and soul of the economy is military-industrial complex and the civilian uh, economy kind of runs as a spin-off out of this and, and we're seeing you know classic the, the nuclear industry is classically that so we've got to always remind ourselves this was a propaganda ploy these uh, nuclear uh, you know peaceful uses of, of nuclear energy this was an effort to make the weapons manufacturers the military contractors to give them a kind of human face but of course we know that the plutonium that nuclear power plants produces 
that's necessary for the building of nuclear bombs. And we see in Iran, any, in India, Pakistan, you know, the, 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 the dynamics is, oh, we're just going to build a, a peaceful uh, nuclear uh, plant to, to generate energy. But in fact, uh, uh, you know, and, there, and there's many uh, spin-offs of, of nuclear um, byproducts of generating nuclear energy that are used in military um, so in Japan, how else did the United States influence and affect the Japanese government and people? Well, it was, uh, um, Japan essentially was a, a colony of, uh, of, the, of the United States. Uh, the San Francisco Treaty theoretically um, gave the self-government, uh, self gave the J Japanese back their, their self-government. But in that era of the uh, Cold War, uh, of course, you know, you had uh, uh, Keenan, George Keenan, with his uh, philosophy of containment. We've got to contain communism, we've got to uh, contain the Soviet and then the Soviet Chinese um, polities and, and, and their, their um, sort of imperial system. So Japan and Germany became the sort of key points of, of, of containment and so in Japan the, the top Nazis, many of them the, the financiers were incorporated into the CIA. Uh, the Nazis after all grew up as an anti-communist, you know their preoccupation was anti-communism so after World War II that expertise in anti-communism, if I could call it that, was incorporated into the US uh, national security state, military industrial complex. So Japan and, and West Germany uh, were you know, very geopolitically central points of engagement in, in, in the Cold War. So, so a lot of the um, government in those, in those polities, uh, you know, it was on a covert level, but, but U.S. was pulling many of the strings. So did the United States intervene in the uh, political process through the parties, the Liberal Democrats? Uh, the whole thing was, you know, Shariki would be a, a perfect example. I mean, once you're controlling the media, uh, you're controlling the political culture. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing with Fukushima right now is yet more proof that the commercial media in the United States, and I include the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Canada, the BBC in Britain, the Australian Broadcasting Corporations, uh, they are not in the business of public education, giving the public what we need to know for our interests so we can survive. I mean, this whole nuclear energy industry, there's a, a fair amount of uh, education, public education, that needs to take place. When you, when I, when you start to talk about a half-life, a, a radionuclide having a half-life of so many hundreds of thousands of years, uh, um, these are not easy concepts. This whole, bi this whole uh, realm of science is, is uh, on the frontiers of human knowledge and understanding. So uh, uh, here is yet another demonstration that, that uh, the mainstream media are preventing, are holding back basic information that we require to make the political decisions that we need to do. And if, you know, without an informed citizenry, without a citizenry given access to the important information of what's going on in our times, it's a kind of fraudulent political system. And we, we do live in an area where, where our political culture is, is so bought and paid for, is such an extension of um, you know, global corporations and, and these huge concentrations of wealth in very few people's hands. Uh, to, to maintain that system requires a, such an you know, increasingly grotesque distortion of, 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 of information, of holding back of information. And I think you know, the contamination, the radioactivity that we're talking about, uh, which is going to create millions of cancers and deformities, and, and this is permanent. This is in the gene pool for all time. It's not like if we can uh, you know, go through a couple of generations, we can repair ourselves. That's one of the devastating things. Uh, depleted uranium, I mean, the, you know, is being shot in shooting galleries in the United States. Uh, you know, it, it, there just seems to be a, a free and open season on, on this kind of contamination of, of, of environments uh, with, with this 
radioactive material, but think about the contamination of the psychological environment, of the mental environment, the twisting of information in such ways that, uh, or, or the the holding back of information and replacing it with disinformation, uh, pre 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 presenting a fraudulent account of what is real, uh, presenting a, a basis for a public mythology. It's, it's, a, it's a toxification and a pollution of the psychological environment, the mental environment.